nothing seems to be shock isolated. However, you are in a very big structure. This is just like a huge bird cage. Three levels, one level above us, the Spartan living quarter. This here was the control center, and below us there's an equipment storage area, all kinds of equipment, including two, two huge batteries. This structure hangs inside the concrete dome. It is suspended from the wall of this concrete dome by eight sets of huge springs. There's also a gap between the concrete dome and the structure of 12 inches. So if there would be any vibration coming from the outside, this could wiggle up and down, side to side. Our major here wouldn't even spill a coffee, and our deputy wouldn't spill a coke. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? <laughs> the uh, crew of four was made up out of two officers and two enlisted. The officers could be male or female. One of the last commander of this side here was Yvonne Morris. She is now the director of this museum. Let me give you a little tour through this level here. Over there in the corner, that's a blast well, protecting the fresh air intake. The, blast, the fresh air intake is a three feet diameter pipe. Inside is a ladder, could be used as an emergency escape hatch. If there would be any overpressure on the outside of more than two pounds per square inch, this would shut down and the whole system would be switched to recirculated air. This red safe there, that is called the EVO safe, emergency wall order safe. As you can see, it has two locks, one for the commander, one for the deputy, each one with its own combination. They didn't know each other's combination. The incoming crew brought their locks with them, and after taking inventory, put their locks on here. The outgoing took their locks with them. Inside, you have information which is needed to launch the missile, in addition to the information which came with the launch order. This young, pretty looking lady here, she is a deputy, and she is in charge of communications and security. Those are the terminals for the antenna's top side. Security, the whereabouts of everybody on site had to be grease penciled on this local level. This is a so-called no known zone area. There's a big sign on the cabinet there, on the side of the cabinet, which means always, always had to be two people on this side here, everywhere, except for the living quarter of office, which is very spartanic, like a motor one and a half. This, uh, Everybody, or there always had to be two people here. One had to be an officer, and they all had to be eyeball to eyeball. I don't trust you, and you don't trust me. I watch you, and you watch me. If I go behind this cabinet, you have to follow me and watch what I'm doing. The uh, clock here is the EVO clock, emergency war order clock. It's a mechanical clock. In those days, they didn't trust battery operator clocks. As you can see right now, it's 19 hours and about 30 minutes. This here is the local time. It's now 12 hours and 30 minutes. This is the launch clock, and this is the lunch clock. <laughs> Where do you think this is the right time? Greenwich mean time, or Zulu time, or Z time military terminology. All activities by American armed forces worldwide are always conducted on Greenwich Mean Time. Why? In order to avoid the confusions created by time zones. Greenwich Mean Time, always the same time. In addition to the two officers, there were two highly trained technicians. The first one was in charge of facility projects like water and sewage and elevator and telephone and the unit. There were more than 40 of those on site. The second one, he was in charge of the guidance system and the missile. The most important responsibility of the first guy was electricity. Electricity was purchased from a local utility company, just like you and I do at home. 
just like you have power outages in the state where you come from, they have power outages here. This system could never be without power. As a backup, there is a diesel power generator in the silo in a 50 kW, and that kicked on immediately. But it took about 30 sec 50 seconds to bring it up to full speed. To bridge those 50 seconds, there are two huge batteries below us in this equipment storage area. And those two batteries, they were always signal charges, and they were powerful enough even to launch the missile just with the power of those two batteries. This here is the panel for the Doppler radar system I talked about topside. This is a fault indicator. On a daily basis, subsystems had to be tested of the readiness. And if something went wrong, then they had all these instruction books in the shelf over there, and they could try to fix it. In most cases, they didn't fix it. They just defined it down to the lowest replacement level, and then they called in help from the Air Force Base in, in Tucson. And there were more than 400 highly trained technicians, and they were always ready to come and help, and if necessary, they came with my helicopter. In the uh, video, they talked to you about uh, the butterfly valve. Remember this? The butterfly valve is a safety device which blocks the fresh air, not the fresh air, <laughs> which blocks the propellants. Uh, fuel and oxidizers into, into the engines. There was a pin here, and in order to launch the uh, uh, missile, this butterfly valve had to be open in order for the oxidizer to flow and, 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 and the fuel to flow. To open this here, it required a special code. The code was never on site. It came with the launch order. <laughs> but it's very simple only six digits, and you have to punch in those six digits here. However, each one of those thumb wheels has 16 characters. So the number of possible combination to unlock this valve is 16 to the power of six. Any idea how many those are? She knows it. She knows it because she gets all this money here as a major. <laughs> she told me that 16 million seven hundred seventy-seven thousand two hundred sixteen, didn't you? Yeah. See? <laughs> Our training takes off. <laughs> you think that's a good number? Not for the Air Force. You see, the Air Force guys, they are very conservative. They wear belts and suspenders just to be on the safe side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they put in a tie stronger, T-R-Y. Over the life of the system, you had six ties to work out the combination. If you didn't get it done in six ties, this well would, would freeze and uh, would have taken a team from the Air Force Base a couple of days to bring the whole system back to life. You never did it, Major. If you would have done it, you could start writing your resume right here because you know, any advancement in the American Armed Forces, my wife. <laughs> Sad story, unemployment line. <laughs> Nobody ever did it. The uh, missile was programmed for three different targets. Major, the primary target for this missile site is number two. Do you know anything about number two? Do you know where it's located? Do you know anything about it? Yeah, it's after one and before three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically, if you would be honest to me, you would tell me, I don't know anything. Okay. You see, that's the answer. That's the right answer. Anybody who ever worked here, nobody ever knew where target number two was. They didn't have to know, they didn't want to know, they didn't need to know. There was a need to know philosophy. If you didn't need to know this kind of information, you didn't get it. If you would be a bomber pilot, and you would have to take a nuclear device to a specific city, you have to know where it is. These people here, they didn't have to know where it is. They only had to know where to push the button or turn the key. The uh, nuclear device could be set for air burst or ground burst. Air burst meaning explosion at very high elevation.
population, 40,000 feet high to take out huge areas. Or, ground burst close to the ground to take out hard objects, such as uh, hydro dams or ICBMs like this one here. We know that this was set for ground burst, but that's all we know. The nuclear bomb, which was a hydro bomb, was the largest nuclear device America ever installed on an intercontinental ballistic missile. It had a yield of explosive power of 9 megatons, which is the equivalent of 9 million tons of TNT, which is about 620 times the power of the bomb which was dropped on the ocean. I'll give you another equivalent. If you take 9 million tons of TNT and put them into boxcars and make a long train out of it, this train is going to be 1,200 miles long, all filled with explosive power. It was an awesome bomb. Power distribution control, power breakers, and this was called MECGEC, Missile Alignments, Guidance, and Checkout Code. This was state of the art. This was the interface to the missile, to the computer on the missile. State of the art in the early 60s. It was built and designed and built to last for 10 years. All of those panels, they were filled with electronics. After 10 years, it was still a good system, and the Air Force wanted to maintain it, they wanted to keep it. But they ran into major problems, spare part problems. Many of the parts weren't built anymore. So at that time, Delco Electronics and IBM, they were working on a new universal guidance system for the Boeing 747. They applied this technology in this case, which enabled them to condense all of the electronics into one panel. All of the other panels are empty now. This was done in 78. If you would do this today, you would end up in a chip like this here. But the Air Force guys, they would still put a big panel on top of it because they like to push buttons. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, target and flight information was uh, entered in here via punch tapes. Some of you may say, that's okay. But that was good. Mechanical, you couldn't fill with it electromagnetically. If you added another hole to it, it didn't work anymore. That was a very safe system. There's a reader and a recorder for verification. Okay, uh, Major and Deputy, are you guys ready to launch the missile? <laughs> a sketch work. <laughs> All right, one of you guys on the same team. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Who could give the order to launch the missile? Who could give the order to launch the missile? The president. the president. Only the president. And some of you may recall when he went overseas, there was always an officer running behind him with a briefcase chained to the vessel. That was called the football. That contained the message. The message was finally piped in here via those loudspeakers from 2nd Omaha, Alaska, and from the 15th Air Force Base in California two totally different locations, in case one of the locations was already wiped out at the time. It started with a huge warbling noise, followed by an Alpha and American code. Sounded similar to this one here. So 38 letters and numbers came across. The uh, two officers immediately took their emergency action message books and wrote down the Alpha and America code. They did this repeatedly, then they exchanged the books and read each other's notification. If they were identical, they were authorized to open the EOC. The first part of this message identified in there a specific card, two letters. They found the card and uh, broke the seal, and inside they found a five-digit number. The five-digit number had to be identical with the second part of this message. If this was the case, they knew that they had an authentic message originated from the president. The, uh, the message also contained two other pieces of information. 
time to launch the missile. Could be in a minute, could be an hour, could be next day. The police canceled it on the face of the star. Then, and also the butterfly valve code. They put the butterfly valve code in here, just to green, they knew they had a good code. Then they took out two keys. One for the commander, inserting it over here, and one for the deputy commander, inserting it over here. As you can see, this is too far away for one person to do it at the same time. They were spring-loaded to the off position. They had to be turned within two seconds, and they had to be held for five seconds. Okay, guys, I am going to give you the countdown. When I say launch, you push in the keys, and you turn it to the right. We do this over here, she does it over there. So, in two seconds. Yeah, you will do it. If you're lucky, yeah. if you're lucky we can still save some distance. Three, Three, two, one, launch. Turn it to the right and hold it for five seconds. Three, four, excellent. Thank you very much. You must have done this before. <laughs> you did something which cannot be stopped. There is no hoops button here. <laughs> this is just like a trigger is pulled and the, and the, the bullet is coming out of the rifle. The, we didn't have the technology to do anything, to communicate with this missile anymore. If we wouldn't have had the technology, the Soviets would have figured it out and you don't want this baby coming back at you. Launch enabled. The batteries on the missile are fought for, forced fed with electrolyzer, gradually the curve of the open. When it breaks the radar system, the alarm goes off down here. Guidance system go, last handshake between MECAC and the missile and the, uh, and the missile. The missile knew where to go, how to get there, and what to do once it got there. The uh, propellants come together, hyperbolic reaction, when 77% of the thrust is achieved during launch. The explosive nuts and bolts are fired and the missile can rise out of its silo. It took us exactly 58 seconds from turning the key until liftoff. And now, after 35 minutes, 6,500 miles down the road, target number two would cease to exist. There are two things left for you to do. Quench the fire in the silo and close the closure door. Your last order was wait for further orders. If you got the further order, you were very happy because you knew somebody was alive topside. If you didn't get this order, you had two choices. You could try to climb through the fresher intake, and most probably you would have seen a world you had never seen before. Or you could sit here and suffocate. After about 20 days or so, you were running out of food and they circulated air. This decision never had to be made. The system did exactly what it was supposed to do. It did nothing. Those guys were sitting here for more than 20 years, waiting for the order to come. The order never came. Peace through deterrent worked. It kept the peace for more than 20 years. Each side knew you cannot win a nuclear war. You only create a mutually assured destruction. A mad scenario. Okay, uh, Major and Deputy, you turned the key. You took the responsibility. Okay. Now we have to go out there and see whether the missile is there. If the missile isn't there, we have a problem. Somebody has to pay for it. Did you bring your piggy bank? <laughs> no? I'm trying to Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's more than I am, right? That's your age. <laughs> you did a super job, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Air Force for your nice job you have done. And as a little momentum, I am authorized to hand you this little souvenir here. What is written in the middle? I turned the key. See? <laughs>